Hello and welcome back to this final lecture, lecture number 10 of CCNA2 Routing and Switching Essentials with me, Joachim Shevrestad from the University of Hövde. Uh, the topic of the day is really some miscellaneous material that I guess Cisco couldn't fit somewhere else. Uh, and as always, try to do the practicals, make sure that you throughout the course listen and re-listen, read the material on Netacad if you're taking this as a Cisco, Cisco Academy course. Um, and also make sure that you do the practical so that you prepare and really grasp the knowledge on a practical level. And as always, if you liked listening to this uh, lecture series, you should really apply for one of our courses and come to us and take a course live on www.his.se. So what we're going to do now is, as I said, a little bit of everything. So basically we're going to look into device discovery, device management and maintenance. Um, so we're going to do this by digging into the Cisco Discovery Protocol, which I believe I mentioned earlier. Uh, Cisco Device uh, Discovery Protocol, or CDP, is a layer 2 protocol that is Cisco proprietary and it's used to gather information about devices. So how this works is basically that a CDP-enabled device will send out uh, information about itself on all interfaces. Um, it's on by default and what you can do is that you can use um, use a Cisco router to do a show CDP neighbors and then you get some information about your neighbors. So if you want to disable it, what you do is you go in no CDP run in global configuration mode or do no CDP enable on a single interface to disable it on an interface. Uh, actually, in my opinion, this is not a very good monitoring solution. There are better ones, so it's, it can be a good thing to disable it for security reasons. Because if you manage to get into a network with CDP enabled, uh, you'll actually get so much information just by plugging yourself into one device that you can actually map the entire topology of that network as far as networking equipment goes. Uh, so that is CDP, not dig deep, digging deep into it. If you're interested, do the practical and, and read more in the material. And there is also a vendor neutral alternative that does basically the same, sharing information about device ID and capabilities. You enable it using LDP run, and yeah, it's called LDP as well. Uh, and you can do show LDP neighbors on a Cisco router to see what devices uh, are the neighboring routers. And you can also have, yeah, you see that you what you do is get the device ID, the host name, and you get the capabilities that it holds. So R is a router, B is a bridge, very, very interesting stuff. Something that is actually more important is NTP or Network Time Protocol. Uh, NTP is used to synchronize clocks against a central server. And this is actually, uh, actually sort of important because timing is important in networks. So the reasons that it is important is because there are several services that depend on it. So for instance, if you're running a Windows domain with Windows Active Directory, you're going to use the protocol Kerberos for authentication. And Kerberos doesn't allow the clocks to go different in the domain, so that won't work if the time isn't correct. Also, it's important for the accuracy of log entries. I mean, if you want to troubleshoot something looking at log files, it's good to know when the logs came and then the clocks need to be correct. So in the topic of NTP, there is something called strata that we need to know about. And strata is basically a measure of how trustworthy or uh, yeah, how trustworthy the source is. So if you have an atomic clock, that will be stratum zero. So uh, if you connect to a stratum zero clock, you will be a stratum one device. Uh, you can be a you can also be an NTP server. So say like in the scenario here, the machines on this level can be NTP servers, and they are connected to an atomic clock, so they will be stratum one devices. On the next level, you may connect to those Stratum 1 servers, and then you'll be a Stratum 2 device, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is sort of a measure on reliability, so how far from an atomic clock are we? Um, it's quite good practice to have your own NTP server in your network, of course, uh, but to configure a device to use NTP, that's what we're going to do in this case. Uh, what you do is basically that you go into a configuration terminal and then you do NTP server and then the IP address of an NTP server. So show clock detail, that's going to show the clock and the time source for a router. So a, the clock on a router is actually not set by default. So if you want to uh, verify the clock settings, you do show clock detail. And if you haven't set a time, you will get a message for that. And if it's set 
by uh, locally on the router using the clock set command then you'll see the output saying time sources user configuration and if you do ntp server then you're going to see time sources ntp and this is a nice way to to actually ensure that the clocks are set to the same time within your entire network use one and the same ntp server so you can do show NTP status and show NTP associations to verify NTP. And that is basically it for this very first part of this lecture. So if there are any questions, grab a teacher or post them in the comments field and maybe someone, someone in the world will answer for you. What we're going to do now is have a look on syslog, which is the logging facility that is uh, very commonly used within uh, at least Linux and Cisco routers and for a number of more applications. So syslog is a very common logging uh, protocol. It's made up from the idea with syslog is that you have a syslog server where you send log messages. So whether it's a router or it's a PC or it's a server or whatever, you can send all log messages to one and the same logging server. And from there, you're able to you're able to work with your combined amounts of logs. So that's the idea. Uh, Syslog is able to send out uh, logging messages to uh, a number of different sources, including a logging buffer that you can uh, you can see a log file as a logging buffer, where you can actually go in and locally read log messages. You can also, as is common in the default in the Cisco world, you can see that Syslog messages can be sent out the console line or the terminal line, and it can also be sent, as we said before, to a central Syslog server. So some of the things that we need to know about when we talk about syslog is first of all warning levels. So every log entry that is generated using syslog will be associated with a warning or severity level. There are the, by default the severe, severity levels of 1 through 7 where a level 1 message is an emergency which basically renders a system unusable and level 7 is a debugging message that is just in for even less severe than informal. And then we have everything in between with alert, alert critical error, warning, notification, and infor informal, uh, informational. So apart from the warning levels, there is also syslog facilities. And in syslog terminology, a facility is a service identifier and will identify where a log message came from. So looking at the syntax for syslog in the Cisco world, we begin with a sequence number followed by a timestamp, and then we have this percent facility and severity and the actual message. So if we do an example from, uh, from an actual log message, we have a timestamp here, and then we have link. So in this case, link is the severity, uh, or link is the facility, uh, sorry. And then we have the three, which is the severity level. So going back to the reference table, this would be an error, uh, and it would be an error message from, uh, from a link facility. So it has to do with links in some way. And then we can see in the actual uh, in the actual message that is an interface called port channel that changed state to up. So it's sort of a weird error, but it's still regarding an error message. Uh, so continuing with syslog, something you should know with the timing is that as a default behavior, syslog messages are not timestamped uh, and you have to enable timestamping by uh, issuing the service timestamps log datetime command and you do that in global configuration mode and if you're not using NTP the clock has to be manually set on the router because clocks are not set by default and you do that with a clock set command so clock set hour uh, minute second and then month day and year so how do we go configure this syslog well uh, first off to view syslog we need a syslog server uh, and the server uh, there are several free syslog servers available uh, and there there is one in packet uh, in packet tracer in the server but if you're using a windows or linux machine i mean there are thousands uh, i'm sure there are thousands different syslog servers available so by default cisco devices will send log messages out the console uh, show logging will display information about syslog services uh, servers and the way uh, syslog settings and the way that we configure the syslog to actually send logging messages to a syslog server instead is by doing logging and then the IP address of the syslog server. We can also do logging trap and a number and what the number logging trap will do is that it will decide what severity levels to send to the syslog server. So in this case we're using 
uh, logging trap four and what that means is that every message that is four or more severe will be sent to the syslog server so if we look back on our severe level you should know that the higher the number the less severe so if we do logging trap four what we're saying is that warning level four up to emergency level zero will be sent to the syslog server then uh, it's a little bit a um, uh, little bit hard to know which interface to use to send the logging messages so that's not going to be uh, be visible in the syslog server unless we do logging source interface and then specify um, a source interface for for uh, for log messages so on that note let's do a practical before we end the course so what we're going to do in this practical is that we basically have a syslog server and an NTP server and we're going to configure the networking devices to send messages to the syslog server. So what we have to do first is go into the syslog server and go to services and enable syslog. So we enable syslog and there we have a syslog server. Next thing we're going to do is configure the networking devices to use the syslog server. So we start with the router and what we're going to do is that we go into configuration terminal and then we do logging ser logging and then we do the IP address of the server. So the IP address will be 10.0.1.254 and then just for the fun of it we also want to do logging trap 4 to only have messages of severity level warning and higher. Uh, okay, so in Packet Tracer we can only do logging, trap, debugging. So let's just skip that. That's unfortunate. Uh, what we're going to do now is that we're going to create a loopback interface because that's a simple way of generating some log messages. And if we go to the syslog server and everything worked correctly, we will be able to see that there are some log messages. So there aren't for some reason. Did I misconfigure the IP address? Let's do uh, some troubleshooting. So we do end. Uh, okay, I guess that has to do with the fact that, because as you see now, that when I do end, I do get messages here. So I guess that the uh, trap level isn't uh, set to isn't set to include those level five, or otherwise it just hadn't started yet. So everything seems to work fine. That's unfortunate. That's fortunate. As you see here, we don't have time included. We're going to get back to that in a little while. But first, let's configure logging on the switches as well. So on the switches, we're actually instructed to do a clock set first. If I remember correctly, that's a privileged executive command. So we do clock set, and then we do uh, hour, month, and second. So let's just do one one because we're lazy and don't want to figure out what time is it. It is. So we say that it's 11, 11, 11. Then we're going to have the day of uh, the day of the month or the month of the years. So let's do June first, and then the day. So June eighth, and then finally a year. So let's do 2011. It's not 2011, but whatever. Uh, then we can also do. Uh, go to configuration terminal and we configure the switch to include a timestamp in log messages. So we do that by service timestamps log and date time. And then at some Cisco devices, you also have to include msec to make sure that it includes milliseconds in timestamps. So there are, as you see throughout the course, there are those small differences between packet tracer and physical gear. There are also minor differences between routers and switches. And there are also difference be differences between iOS versions. And that's just something that we have to live with. So, well, anyhow, now let's do logging 10.0.1.254. And I do want to do logging trap and something. So we're only allowed to do logging trap debugging. So let's do that. Now it should be severity level seven and uh, everything more. So everything should end up in the syslog server. So what we do now is that we go do an interface. Uh, let's do a interface fast ethernet zero uh, 11 and we shut it down. So that's going to create some log entries and 
didn't show up. So let's do end. That showed up before at least. Okay, now logging started to uh, to the syslog server. So okay, uh, let's do a configuration terminal. There is some delay here, so we do interface for Ethernet zero eleven. We do no shutdown. Change state to up. Is it coming? No, it's not coming. No log. Mm. Let's do exit. No logging trap debugging. Let's do an end. And there finally something showed up in the syslog server. And now you see that we also have the timestamps here. So the activity instructs us to do the same thing on switch two. I say, why the hell should we want to do that? What we want to do is configure NTP on router one. So to configure NTP, we need an NTP server. So I guess we have to go enable that. So we go into the NTP server here in the activity. And what we do is go to services, we go to NTP and we select on and we have a date set here. So let's go with that. So now we have an NTP server going very nice. So next we go into the router and we can do an NTP. No, we have to go to configuration terminal and we do NTP and we do server and then the IP address of the server, which is 64.103.224.2. Make no mistake, I'm sure you're going to configure NTP in a practical some, uh, sometime. So we have that configured. So let's go see clock and how the hell did we display clock that's not good to that's not that's something that I always forget okay I'm actually leaving it up to you so go configuration terminal and we just do service timestamps log daytime and then I guess we have to do msec again. So now we enabled uh, timestamps in logging. And what we want to do now is do end because that appeared to give us some error messages. You see here in the syslog output to the console that we get uh, a log entry containing the current date. And in the syslog server, there is also one here that is from the router. So with that said, let's go back to the theory and finish off this course. And for the end of this course, we're going to look at some maintenance. So first off, something that you want to do is back up the running or the running config. And so far, we've been doing it locally by doing copy running config startup config. But you may want to do it to an external source. So one of the ways you can do it is backing it up to a text file. And to do that, what you would do is just copy the entire configuration to a text file. And if you need to restore, you just paste the configuration into a fresh into a fresh device. So the only thing that you need to know here is that when you have a configuration file and you have passwords, those are going to be encrypted because we did use service password encryption if we did things right. And if you want to restore, you have to change those encrypted passwords for the plain text ones before you paste the configuration into the router. And you can also back up to a TFTP server. So if there is a TFTP server running on your network, what you can do is just copy running config TFTP and the device is going to ask you about the IP of the TFTP server and the copy will happen. And likewise, you can copy back the running config from the TFTP server by going copy TFTP running config. So with that note on backup, we're going to have a few words on Cisco iOS images and licenses. So if you uh, do the show flash zero command, you're going to see what iOS that is in the in the device, the file name of the Cisco iOS. And the file name will actually tell you quite a lot about the capabilities of the image. So first you should know that Cisco devices are shipped with the universal image. So if you buy a Cisco uh, 2900 series switch, you will get a, a image that are universal for all of the switches of that uh, uh, with that hardware and then licenses are used to enable feature sets. So your switch can usually do quite a lot of things looking at the hardware, but it's restricted using a license. Uh, so if you wanna see what iOS you have, show, fl show flash zero, and then we have a couple of different parts here. So beginning we have the hardware, the platform, 
and then we have the image image designation so the image designation it is basically telling you what capabilities that can be on this device uh, then we can see the memory location and the compression format followed by a dig digital signature item i indicator then we have the major release and minor release numbers and new feature release so this is ios version 15 minor release 2 and next next uh, and next feature release is 4 uh, and then we have m3 here which is the extended maintenance release and maintenance rebu rebuild ended by file extension so not digging deeper into this but it can be good to at least know that you can see what hardware you're having and the image designation and also at the 152 here, that means that it's the release 15.2 of the iOS. So what happens if we want to update the iOS image? Well, uh, to install a new iOS image, you have to begin with downloading it and placing it on a TFTP server. This is the simplest way. Then you simply copy it to the router using copy TFTP colon flash colon. A flash zero colon and finally you, we just go issue the boat system command to inform the router to use the new image instead of the old one so with that said we have to look a little bit on licensing because as we said whenever you big, buy a device you usually you also have to buy or get a license so most uh, at least access routers will have the IP base uh, licensing model and the IP base will support BGP OSPF EIGPR, RIP, and the features that we've seen throughout this course. And, and that is all well and nice, but what you can do then is that you can buy other licenses. So you can buy the security license, the unified communication license, or the data license. And you do that if you need to unlock more feature sets. So for instance, if you need to have Cisco iOS firewall, or you need to have good VPNs, then you buy the security feature feature set the license and then you can just install the new license and unlock those features. So the licensing process is that you first purchase a package or, uh, package or feature from Cisco and you will get what is called a pack. Then you can use the pack to digitally get the license from the Cisco license portal or the Cisco license manager. And then you get the license file back and then you install the license to a router. This is not likely something that you will do in the course, but it may be something that you'll have to do in your future line of work. So it should be good to know about it and you can practice and do it. I, I think there is a practice task for you in the CCNA material. I'm not gonna go through it here because, well, I don't I don't really wanna, want to. So uh, I will leave digging deeper into licensing as a task for you to do on your own. And with that said, this actually was the end of this CCNA 2 version 6 video lecture. Uh, and I want to thank, thank you for attending the course. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I especially hope you enjoyed it if you're t looking at this video lectures as part of one of my uh, in-classroom courses. If you want to do take our in-classroom courses from University of Hvide, you go to www.his.se and see what we have to offer. If you're foreign, if you're non-Swede, we have a lot of exchange student courses and we have a lot of courses running in English. You can come here. If you're a European citizen, Swedish, um, Swedish education is free, so it's very uh, beneficial for you. Uh, also, remember to do the practicals. There is a nice skills integration challenge in 10.4.1.1 that will cover the entire course. Uh, before you do a practical test, I really encourage you to make sure that you are comfortable with that skills integration challenge. And with that said, this was the end of this course. Uh, thank you for attending. My name is Joachim Schäverstad from the University of Skövde. This is the end.